thank you for your experience. Thank you for staying by our side. Thank you for choosing us, for loving us, and for desiring to be the Lord who takes that stand in us and enables us to stand through the most trying times in our lives. Thank you for what you have in store for us today and how you're about to teach us more about what's coming ahead. Humble our hearts, Lord, that we may know how to be able to be found grounded and established on the truths of the Lord for our time. We give you glory and honor, Lord. May you forever and ever be magnified. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God uh, for the privilege to be able to still worship him and have the freedom to worship him in a time like this. Uh, God has given us so many opportunities. I mean, I look back and he's taught us so much. And glory be to God for that. We're still in the series, The End Time Power, speaking about the power of the Holy Spirit. We're going to go into, how should I put it? We're going to go into a sub-series. Uh, we're going to talk about attacks. Our, our upcoming three sessions will be specifically about attacks. And the reason why I want to talk about is these three great attacks that are coming to God's people in the times to come. And... We'll talk about first, this first attack today and then talk about the next two attacks in the coming weeks. But friends, we're not just talking about the deceptions and the attacks coming against God's people. The reason why we're studying them is because we want to see the relationship with the Holy Spirit. We want to see the need of the Holy Spirit in relation to be able to stand through these attacks. How much we need the Spirit of God to be able to be found standing in these deeply devious times that are ahead of us. So that's going to be our focus as we go through this tripartite experience. Let's start with Luke chapter 4 verse 1 and listen to the words of Jesus as we hear these very, very powerful words. Jesus experienced rather in Luke 4 verse 1, the Bible says, And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. The Bible tells us, that Jesus was led by the Spirit. He had just been baptized. And as he was baptized, he's returning from Jordan. He's filled with the Spirit of God. And the Bible says that the Spirit of God led him into the wilderness. Now that's sort of disturbing. We look at the time of him in the wilderness, and while he's in the wilderness, he was tempted by the devil. Um, Interestingly, if you look elsewhere in Scripture, uh, the Bible says it differently in a parallel gospel. Notice, notice, notice what the Bible says about Jesus uh, being tempted by the devil in the wilderness. And I like this. If you read Matthew chapter 4, uh, it's, a, it's a parallel passage, but notice how Matthew describes the same event. We just read Luke 4.1, and Luke 4.1 says, Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit where? In the wilderness, right? So he's led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now add this to Matthew 4 verse 1, and a completely sort of a different picture emerges. Matthew 4.1 says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness, same thing. But then Matthew says, To be tempted of the devil. And that sort of is very, is very unsettling because Matthew 4, 1 is saying that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And you ask the question, so wait, so what you're saying is that the Holy Spirit led Jesus into temptation? Isn't that sort of contrary to what Scripture actually says Christ is going to do? But this is so powerful to recognize, friends, because right from the springboarding into the deep end of the pool of this reality, the Lord reveals to us what the experience really was. We know from Luke 4, 1, we read, Jesus was full of the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit was simply leading him into the wilderness. By the way, what was Jesus doing in the wilderness? The Bible tells us in Matthew 4 and verse 2, if you, if you read Matthew 4, 2 tells us that, when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. So we're told that Jesus was in the wilderness. And we know from the spirit of prophecy that as he came out of River Jordan, 
he was on his knees face facing the lord and he was crying out to the lord pleading for him to be accepted of the father pleading for the life work he was going to take upon to be accepted of the father to be able to start this ministerial work and it's it's so profound we're told that even john the baptist was stirred to to see jesus pray in this manner being the son of god pleading with the father for him to be accepted how much more should we be praying then but then notice the reality that part of his preparation was being in the wilderness where self-denial was the experience he was fasting and often people uh, equate fasting to not eating and so as long as i'm not eating that day i'm fasting i'm sorry um when all you do is not eat and claim that to be a fast that's not fasting that's called dieting when all you're skipping is a meal skipping meals is not called fasting it's called dieting all you you lose all you will lose at the end of skipping meals is weight not sin the purpose of fasting is to push life aside, not just your meals. The purpose of fasting is to push life aside, as Jesus did. You would say, but wait, he just wasted 40 days. He could have shared so many messages. See, that's where we lose focus. He spent those 40 days receiving strength and power and a deeper communion so that he could have something to share. And if we don't have those wilderness experiences, we have nothing to give to the world. So after 40 days and 40 nights, he was a hunger. And there he was. There he was in that experience of self-denial. But the Bible says in Matthew 4, 1, he was led by the Spirit to be tempted of the devil. Now, friends, that text is not saying that the Spirit was pushing Jesus to the devil to be tempted. But that scripture actually reveals to us what happens when we seek to get closer to the Lord. And I think every individual present here for worship today could testify that every time you've sought to take a step closer to Jesus, the devil has made it a living nightmare for you. Every time you've started to come closer, there are all kinds of challenges the devil will throw your path. I was sharing with friends the other day. Uh, when I was in college, a friend shared experience with me that every time this friend would pray, before taking a test, listen to this. Every time this friend would pray before taking a test in class, he would fail. Every time he would pray before taking a test in class, he would fail. What do you counsel that friend? Stop praying? Because that's what the devil wants him to do. Look, every time you pray, you fail. You should just stop praying. Don't pray, just study hard and give your exams. Don't pray. The reality is friends, Matthew 4, 1 is revealing to us the result the outcome of what happens when God's people seek to deny self and get closer and closer still to the Lord. And that was the experience of Jesus. He was led, he was filled with the Spirit, and the devil could not take that. He wanted to get Jesus perhaps so busy in ministry that he got no time to spend with his Father, that he got no time to commune with his Heavenly Father. And that was the agenda of the enemy is the agenda of the enemy in all our lives to get us so occupied to get us so caught up with life that we forget the life giver and go on about tapping our backs and patting our backs in in, congr in, in, in a congratulatory tone saying that we've accomplished great things for the glory of god now when jesus is hungered we want to pick up the story in matthew chapter 4 and verse 3 that Jesus is very hungry, starving, if you will. In fact, Desire of Ages tells us that after the 40 days, he fell to the ground as one who was dead. Because not only was this deep physical anguish, it was the spiritual anguish to, to be able to counter the devil at, at each of his insinuations and his, and his attempts to deceive and distract him. It was deeply disturbing. At the end of 40 days, he fell to the ground as one who was dead and angels ministered to him. It's, it's such a great hope. It's such a great hope and solace to those who are seeking the Lord in, in honest, sincere fasting, that while we may be feeling that physical weakness, the assurance is angels ministering to us as they minister to Jesus. So Jesus is hungry, and there, there's an angel that appears, and it seems that this angel has come to relieve him of his distress. 
Jesus at, his, at the first sight, this, this angelic being must have been so comforting to think, oh, an angel has come to comfort me. Now, Christ has to make a choice because the insinuation of this being claiming to be a heavenly angel is this. The words are found in Matthew 4 and verse 3. The, the attempt of the devil in these words is, if thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. And that, of course, was very unsettling for Jesus. He now quickly had to make a choice. He's hearing this voice, looks like an angelic being. Now, should Jesus continue to follow the way God has led him through his word, through the inspiration of the Spirit of God, through the lifelong study of God's word? Or should Jesus trust his senses? Should he trust his feelings and follow whatever the angel says? That was the question. That was the dilemma Christ is faced with. Should he choose that direction? He knows God is believing more. Perhaps this is the voice of the Lord that's speaking to him. Now, everything was okay. Everything sounded all right, except for the choice of word, if. For God would never address his own child saying, if you really are my son. Hence, Jesus' response in Matthew 4, verse 4 was with the following words, he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Those were the words of Jesus. Christ recognized the enemy, friends, by the insinuation of doubt, the, the lies that the enemy was suggesting, which really didn't follow with the way his father had been leading him all along. Now, friends, the question to be asked at this point is, this is a very well-known story. The question to be asked is, how did Christ know the Father's plan? Because Christ knew Scripture. Now, 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 you're saying, I know that. But Christ knew Scripture not simply in, a, in an intellectual capacity, not simply on a, on a basis of knowledge, no. He knew Scripture. He knew his Father on a relational level. He knew his father's voice and these words were not his father's voice. Not only was he a Bible student, that's not, that not only did he know the ins and outs, and that, that's not what was the safety. The safety was the relationship that was able to help him identify and be able to distinguish the voice of the father from the voice of the enemy. I hope we understand, friends, that when the devil comes to tempt, he doesn't come with those two horns, a pitchfork, and a tail. Understand that he disguises himself. Here he's disguising and presenting himself as this angel. This is the same thing he did with Eve in the, in the Garden of Eden. In fact, 2 Corinthians 11.14, we are warned, Paul warns us in 2 Corinthians 11.14, and that there is no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Here we are told he's come as a serpent, he's come as an angel. Here we are told that he himself has transformed himself as an angel of light. Now friends, why does he do this? He does this, friends, to attempt to deceive us into falsehoods by assuming a more familiar or a more holy form, if I, if I want to use the terms, to, to present a more trustworthy form so that we could give in to the deceptions of falsehood and to trust our own senses rather than trusting the Word of God. Now someone says, why is this important? I think we've, we understand this. Why is this important, friends? Because at the end of time, the times we're living in, one of the greatest attacks that will be faced by God's people is the attack of spiritualism. Spiritual manifestations, supernatural manifestations that would attempt to deceive us into accepting the falsehoods of the enemy. One precise medium the devil is going to use, has been using, will use with even greater force as we near the end, is this very reality that I will read to you from Review and Herald, April 1, 9, 1875. The prophet says, It is not difficult for the evil angels to represent both saints and sinners who have died. Interesting. 
It is not difficult for evil angels to represent both saints and sinners who have died and make these representations visible to human eyes. These manifestations, listen carefully, will be more frequent and developments of a more startling character will appear as we near the close of time. As we near the close of time. The question then is asked, friends, is it safe then to trust our feelings, our impressions, our senses over the plain word of God? Is it safe to trust ourselves in these times? Is it, is it safe then? Has it ever been safe to lean on our own understanding? Our safety is, of course, in the divinely inspired word of God, but it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there, friends. It's deeper than that. In the book Beware of Angels by Roger Morneau, for those of you who are familiar with him, Roger Morneau tells the story of the Halstead sisters. This is a very disturbing story. A true story about the Halstead sisters who along with others were involved in a Bible study in Oregon in the United States. And as these group got together and were studying the Bible, uh, in due course of time, members of the study group were beginning to be visited by angels. Follow this through. True story. Yes, real angels were appearing to them with supernatural manifestations of powers, I guess. And these brethren, honest-hearted brethren, they were encouraged as God's chosen people with a special light that was being given to them. In fact, uh, they, they, they had claimed that even Jesus himself appeared to them. They were overjoyed. They were so full of happiness. And these angels continued to visit them, continued to instruct them until these angels convinced them that there were some wicked people in the area that needed to be destroyed and that if they go out to destroy them, God would protect them in doing this. What resulted, friends, was the story ending with the murder of several individuals who these sisters claimed to be the wicked who the Lord had instructed them to destroy, to kill. Like Eve, they were curious, these sisters, and they started trusting to their own senses and feelings over these great supernatural manifestations rather than trusting the word of God. But it goes deeper still. It goes deeper still in the book Last Day Events, page 160. We are told that Satan will use every opportunity to seduce men from their religion to, to God. Listen, every opportunity. He and the angels who fell with him will appear on the earth as men seeking to deceive. Now notice, friends, how are we told? We're told that he and the angels who fell with him will appear on the earth as men. Now that's interesting. How are the different forms we're told? We're told he'll appear as an angel of light. We're told he can appear as de our, our dearly departed loved ones. And now we're told him and his angels can also appear as men, as human beings. And we're also warned that during Earth's final crisis, listen carefully, as God's people will experience the shaking, as the judgments of God will be poured, the latter rain will be poured out, we are warned that during Earth's final crisis, the devil will be appearing in all these three manners, through an angel of light, as human beings, as our dead, uh, as, as our dead loved ones, he will use these three forms to be able to come and deceive, if possible, as the Bible says, the very elect. Now ask the question again: Where is the security for God's people? And brethren say, well, it's true. Bible is the security. And brother, you know what? I don't need this message. I am secure. I understand the state of the dead through and through. No one can deceive me on this point. I know the state of the dead very, very well. And friends, that's where the danger is. It's great that we know the state of the dead as Scripture tells us, and that's very important and that's beautiful. But friends, let us understand that while Scripture is involved, while Scripture is the basis on which we firmly stand, understand, friends, that it is critical that we have a living, loving relationship with the Lord in these times, or else we won't be able to make it. It's going to be that relationship that will determine it. Notice what the Prophet says, last day events, the next page, page 161, paragraph 1, the Prophet says, evil angels in the form of believers 
will work in our ranks. Listen to this. Evil angels in the form of believers will work in our ranks to bring in a strong spirit of unbelief. Let not even this discourage you. Listen to this. These angels will not come to you in the form of these wicked angels. They'll come to you in the form of believers who will work in our ranks to bring in a strong spirit of unbelief. Let not even this discourage you, but bring a true heart to the help of the Lord against the powers of satanic agencies. These powers will assemble in our meetings not to receive a blessing, but to counterwork the influences of who? The Spirit of God. Again, friends, we've been emphasizing the need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. This end time power we need not just to know what's coming, but what? To prepare for what's coming. I've repeated that several times. And friends, if in our meetings, if in our worships, we are not filled with the Spirit of God, then we sure will be possessed by a Spirit. Oh, it's a Spirit for sure. But we want to know what Spirit is it. Is it the Spirit of God or is it the Spirit of unbelief, evil spirits, possessing people who claim to be believers? but it will bring a strong spirit of unbelief. And they are present in our meeting not to receive a blessing, but to counterwork the influences of the Spirit of God. Evil angels in the form of men will talk with those who know the truth. Listen, they know the truth. Friends, notice just when you think truth is your defense. Evil angels in the form of men will talk with those who know the truth. They will misinterpret and misconstrue the statements of the messengers of God unless, listen carefully, Unless we follow our leader closely, Satan will obtain the victory over us. Friends, it's plain and distinct. Let us not trust the fact that because I know all the Bible texts regarding the that I'm saved, we're told the prophet warns us. Because these angels will come to those who know the truth. It makes sense if they go deceive those who don't know the truth. Why are they wasting their time on those who know the truth? Because the people oftentimes who know the truth depend too much on their knowledge of the truth and not on the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. Understand, friends, that truth is not chapter and verses, lines and pages. Truth is a person. That person is Jesus Christ. He is the truth. He doesn't have the truth. Listen carefully. He doesn't have the truth. He is the truth. And unless the Bible says we follow our leader, who is the truth, unless we don't follow him closely, we will be deeply deceived at the end of time. We will be deeply deceived at the end of time. The danger, friends, in leaning on our knowledge is the danger of slipping into trusting ourselves. We, we think ourselves safe because, oh, I, I have all the knowledge, I have all the proof texts and all the doctrinal understanding of the state of the dead. This will keep me safe. As if, friends, protecting ourselves comes from knowing certain things. Knowing a few texts we think is going to protect us if we're not close with them. We think knowledge of the truth can save us. The problem is, friends, that when we do this, we leave out the central focus of Scripture, who is Jesus. We leave out the central focus of Scripture, which is a deep, intimate relationship with the God who enables us to bring this truth to power, to bring this truth to effect, to bring this truth to life, to help us make sense and be able to bring to life this relationship in our lives. In fact, Isaiah 11, 2, what are we told? What are we told about the Holy Spirit's role in all of this? It is the Spirit of the Lord that shall rest upon him. He's the Spirit of wisdom and understanding. The Spirit of God, friends, is the Spirit of counsel and might. The Spirit of God is the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. We can't claim to be filled with the Spirit of God and have think that our knowledge, not the knowledge that the Holy Spirit brings, but our knowledge, help us gain the victory how can we claim to be filled with the spirit but have no fear of god how can we claim to be filled with the spirit of god and still lean on our own understanding when the bible says it's the spirit of god upon whom or through whom we we receive the understanding of the lord where where is our focus my friends we're told that 
in these last days, one of the greatest attacks that will be facing God's people is these very deceptions that will be coming our way. Let us understand, friends, that we cannot trust our knowledge. We have to learn to trust upon the Lord. We have to learn to hold on to Him. We have to learn to, to, to claim the promises of God in these last days. And friends, there is so much, there is just so much the Lord is trying to say to us regarding these last days. And there's so much that's happening. You may have heard that these, these very deceptions are picking up speed. Let me first give you a, an old example. This took place in 1986, May 16. This took place in Cokeville, Wyoming, the United States, uh, where a former town marshal by the name of David Young, 43 years old, and his, and his wife, Doris Young, they took 96 children, 18 adults, as hostages at a Cokeville Elementary School. A, a mishap, they had brought gasoline and they wanted to threaten and they were asking for ransom. David Ying was asking for an audience with President Reagan at the time. And they had set up the, this, this bomb device and this bomb device went out, went out accidentally because of the wife. She moved her hand just real quick and the bomb went off. As the bomb went off, she, I think by the explosion, was thrown out the window of, of, of the elementary school. Children were terrified. There were 96 children, 18 adults, and all of them were taken hostage in this experience. Now, he went out, he shot his wife, at David Young, the husband, he went out, shot his wife dead, later on came inside and killed himself. The children were rescued, but the explosion, it just went through the ceiling, and it was, it was a terrible experience. But the children were somehow led to safety. This is now even turned into a movie by the, by the name Cokeville Miracle. What's disturbing about this event, friends, is this, that these children from this elementary school later came out and they began to testify that the way they were able to escape to safety is that their dead loved ones showed up. Is that their dead loved ones, grandfathers or uncles or aunts, they saw that they showed up and showed them the passage to safety. Now, how do you explain that? How do you explain that now? Hey, they, I mean, how can you deny? Them? I saw my grandfather, I saw my uncle, my aunt. They led me to a place of safety. But someone says, oh, that's old. Well, let's pick up a new, more Hollywood version of this story. There's a book written by Todd Burpo and Lynn Vincent, who co wrote a book entitled Heaven is for Real, which is now turned into a motion picture. It's the story of Todd Burpo's three year old son who had appendicitis. And uh, for after quite some time of his complaining, they took him to the emergency room. Uh, they said that you know, their child, three years old, Colton, they said that he had influenza. All the tests, uh, uh, pos uh, all, all, as all the tests for a possible appendicitis came back negative. So they said, up, oh, I think it's influenza. Time passed on. Uh, Colton just, he just kept throwing up, which is when uh, the, the husband and wife uh, decided that, they, that this just does not have to be influenza. It, it must be something much more. So they rushed him to the emergency room again, and they were told that uh, Colton had to have an, an emergency appendectomy. And so if that did not happen, he could possibly die. So they were terrified, I believe. And so he went through that surgery. He survived. But months after surviving the surgery, this three-year-old, later on as he came out of the surgical experience, he shared the story that while he was in surgery, three years old, three years old, friends, he shared that while he was in surgery, he left his body and he went to heaven. Colton, a three-year-old, then goes on to say that he began to describe events that people seemed were impossible for him to know about. For instance, he began to tell his parents about the unborn sister who was miscarried by his mother years ago. He began to tell them uh, details of a great-grandfather who had died 30 years before Colton was even born. It was disturbing. Colton then even went on to explain how he met Jesus riding a rainbow-colored horse. And he said that he sat in Jesus' lap while angels sang songs to him, that he had gone to him that, and that heaven was for real. And then, catch this, very, very interestingly, this next deception was thrown in, that he says he claims that he also saw Mary. He saw Mary kneeling before the throne of God and at other times standing beside Jesus. Interesting. God Burpa was a minister, and 
he began to share this in his church and began to news went around and more people got interested. Now I mean, the story is an emotion picture. Why am I sharing this with us? Because more and more as we near the end, we will be seeing these deeply destructive attacks of the devil upon God's people. We will be faced with these stories. How do you explain this? How do you explain that? And friends, we can't just say, I know this Bible text, I know that Bible text, if we don't know the God of these Bible texts, if we don't have that living, loving relationship with him, the devil will deceive the best of us. Know that these evil angels are not just coming to those who don't know about this. They're coming to men who know the truth. They're coming to men, friends, who know the truth. And their attempt is to misinterpret, misconstrue, Unless we follow our leader closely, the devil will obtain victory over us. And the Holy Spirit is given to us in the midst of all of this, that we need the Spirit of God. We need the Spirit of God filling us and drawing us closer to God, and pulling us out, not just telling us what's coming, but preparing us by, by creating in us, recreating the heart of Jesus in us helping us to be able to be ready to stand at such a time. Friends, we're encouraged. We're encouraged to stick closer to the Lord, to understand that these attacks are coming. And if we're not standing to face these attacks in the power of the Spirit of God, we will very surely be swept away to eternal destruction. That's God's appeal, friends, that comes to us afresh today. Remembering Ephesians 6, 12, and 13, that we're not resting against flesh and blood. We're wrestling against principalities and powers, against the rulers of darkness, against spiritual wickedness in high places. But that's not it. That's not where the text ends. Ephesians 6, 13 goes on to say, Therefore, wherefore take upon the whole armor of God, because we know we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. Our own understanding, our own skill set is not going to see us through. We need to wear the armor of God completely covered with the Lord, that we may be able to withstand, Paul says, in the evil day, having done all to stand. Having done all to stand. We want to be ready, friends. We want to ask the Lord to make us ready for what's coming ahead. Staying close to Him is going to prove crucial as we face these end-time attacks that are soon to come upon God's people. People are already facing it, more and more this will increase and God's people will have to be firmly surrendered in the Lord to be overcomers, to be living in just such a time. If that's your desire, then we kneel in prayer as we ask the Lord to help us. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you once again for the appeals of your word, for the invitations of your Holy Spirit and helping us to understand that Lord, Isaiah 11 reveals to us we cannot even understand these profound truths and realities without the Spirit of God. And that even a knowledge of this truth is not going to save us unless we have a living relationship with the truth. Not Bible text, but the truth who is a person who is Jesus. Help us, Lord God, to stay, to follow our leader closely or else we shall be swept away. Help us, Lord God, to hold on to you no matter what, that we may be found standing and not crumbling under the pressure of temptations, under the pressure of deceptions. May we look to you and live. Thank you so much for revealing to us the attacks and giving us the way and the way out to be able to be found standing in the time of these attacks. May your name forever be praised. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.